I'm Officer Cadet Martinez Chung, and in this lesson, we're going to learn more about winds. So, if you remember your previous lessons, this is kind of a, a, a refresher. And remember, winds within the high will flow clockwise and outwards. So, this is where we have what we call an area of divergence. So, what happens in an area of divergence is as the air within the hive blows outwards, then there's suddenly a hole in, in the center of the high pressure system. And the atmosphere doesn't like to have holes in it. So the, in order to compensate, what's going to happen is the air on top is going to sink down into place and cover the hole. So this will compensate for the flow of air outwards. Next, we have winds within a low. So this is a refresher again. Remember, winds in a, within a low pressure system will flow counterclockwise and inwards. And then that's where we have an area of convergence, which is kind of the opposite of an area of divergence. In this case, remember, the low pressure system tends to suck in all the air, right? So as the air gets sucked into the center, it starts to accumulate and suddenly there's, suddenly there's a lot of air in the center and it usually has nowhere to go but up so it rises next we have different types of breezes and this is important as to come up in exams but first we have a land breeze so land breezes, they, use, they blow at night so what is actually happening is since the land becomes cooler faster than the water then there's going to be a relatively higher pressure area over the land. And the result, remember, air goes from high pressure to low pressure, is the wind will blow from the land towards the water, towards the sea. As you can see in this picture right here, there's a low pressure system being created over the water and high pressure system on the ground. And wind will flow from high to low. Next we have a sea breeze, so this is the opposite. If any of you have ever been to a lake or the actual ocean, for example, you may have experienced this, because this actually occurs in the day when you're actually awake. So what is happening in this case is the land is heating up faster than the water, and this will cause a low pressure system over the land. And again, air goes from high pressure to low pressure, so it will go from the sea to the land. Hence the sea breeze. So the sea breeze, so the sea part, tells you the direction from, from where the wind is coming from, not where it's going, where it's coming from. As you can see in this graphic right here, low pressure system on the ground, high pressure system on the water, and wind. The pers personally, the way I remember this is the sea breeze occurs when the sun is out. That may or may not help you, but it's something. So, what this actually happens because of water. So, water is really stubborn. It does not like to change temperature. If you notice, with all these scenarios, the land is changing temperature faster than the water. And that's why we get land and sea breezes. Next up, we have diurnal variations. So, what diurnal variations are is the daily variation of the wind. So the thing about wind, it doesn't stay the same throughout the day. It changes ever so slightly. So in this case, this is caused by surface heating during the day because uh, during the day the sun comes out, starts to warm things up. Then, so this causes turbulence at the lower levels, which then transfers to stronger upper level winds at the surface. So in general, what you really need to know is that the winds tend to veer and increase throughout the day. So what veering is, I don't think we discussed this yet, veering is the change of direction clockwise. So let's say our winds are coming from the north right now, then throughout the day they will veer and they might be coming more from the northeast rather than just north. That's veering. And so remember winds will tend to veer throughout the day and it will also increase in strength. Then, surfaces will tend to back and decrease during the evening when daytime heating stops. 
So backing is the opposite of veering. So let's say the winds are coming from north and they're going to start back, and back, then they will be coming more from the northwest rather than just north. So a counterclockwise change in direction. And they also decrease in strength. So the way I personally like to remember this is think of the wind as having energy or being a being. So during the day, it's awake, it's veering and increasing because it has a lot of energy. However, as the day goes on, it starts to get tired and tired, and by nighttime, it will back and decrease. It's getting really tired. Gusts. So, gusts are a rapid and brief increase in wind speed. So, this often associated with rapid fluctuations in wind direction. So, what's happening with a gust is any sort of sudden change with the wind, either with direction or speed. So, let's say You've ever been outside on a very windy day and suddenly the wind just picks up and then stops for a second? That's a gust. But again, gusts can also change direction. So let's say winds are coming from the west, they might just randomly shift coming from the east and then back. It has happened before, so you need to be careful when it comes to gusts. Again, if you look at this graph, you can see rapid peaks and loss in the wind speed. So really rapid changes. So you have to really watch out for gusts, especially when you're close to the ground. Squalls. So what a squall is, is literally a gust, a sudden change in direction or speed. But the main difference between a squall and a gust is that a squall lasts longer. So if you remember, in, in a gust, it usually lasts for a little while. So it's a sudden change. In a squall, it changes dramatically and it stays there for a while. This is usually caused by the passage of a really fast moving cold front or thunderstorm. So as you can see in this graph here, usually squalls have to last at least two minutes. So if the sudden change in either wind direction or speed lasts for more than two minutes, then it's a squall. Mechanical turbulence. So if you look at the ground in general, there's a bunch of stuff in it. Trees, grass, and, and people. So what this does is we have mechanical turbulence. The friction between the air and surface features is responsible for swirling air vortices of air, also known as eddies, which kind of rem should remind you of LinkedIn vortices. But in general, if wind starts to hit stuff, so buildings, trees, animals, people, and it just kind of swirls around it, creating some turbulence close to the ground. Tornadoes, this is a fun one. So what tornadoes are is they're violent circular rolls of air usually associated with severe thunderstorm and very deep concentrated lows. So really low pressure in a very small area, concentrated. All right, veering and backing. So as we discussed earlier, but that is the formal introduction. So a veering is a change in direction clockwise. So, wind veers at an increase in altitude. So, the thing to remember here, as you increase in altitude, so as you climb, your, wind, your winds will tend to veer and increase in strength. This is really important when it comes to flight plan. Again, they also veer and increase during the day, as we saw earlier. And then backing. Backing is a change in wind direction counterclockwise. And as opposite to climbing, so let's say we're descending, then the winds will tend to back and decrease as altitude decreases. And they also back and decrease at night. So the way I like to remember is a little bit of a dance. So you have your winds, they tend, as you go up in altitude, they will tend to veer and increase. And then as you decrease altitude, they will back and decrease like so. Wind shear. So wind shear is a sudden tearing or cheering change in wind direction or speed. This can be very violent. So think of it like first we had the gust, which is a sudden change. And this is more a much, much more dramatic gust. It really like pushes you around, it changes really dramatically, like that's wind shear. And it can be very dangerous, especially when you're close to the ground. Which is why usually you will see it in weather reports or air traffic control will, will warn you of wind shear. Next up we have the jet stream. So what the jet stream is, 
it's a narrow band of high speed air. So there's there's a, there's two different air masses in North America, for example. One is just over Canada, the other more close to the US. In between them is a stream of very high, very high, very fast air. So this usually occurs again altitudes ranging from 20,000 all the way to 40,000, and the speed here is usually 100 to 125 knots, but it can also get as high as 250 knots. That's like the average cruising speed of a, of a small jet. So, so what's going on here, again, you have, you have a very high current of air in between two air masses. And this can actually be useful for one. So you can actually use this to get to places faster. So if you have the jet stream on your, as a tailwind, then it can give you more speed and can reduce your fuel consumption and get you to places faster. But at this point, especially in the cadet program, you will not fly high enough to actually experience the jet stream. But you should still know about it. Alright, that's it. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, queries, or random outbursts, feel free to put them in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching! And happy landings!